Hello there guys, it's Joey and today we're going to be talking, as promised, about binding spells. And it's kind of a discussion type video, just to discuss binding spells, how I feel about binding spells, and really sort of present different information about binding spells, because I think, personally, that in the modern interpretation or understanding of binding spells has somehow become incredibly narrowed and limited and kind of has this sort of value judgment attached to them as well which in certain circumstances is merited and in other circumstances is not and we shall be examining that concept in depth as we go through. For the purpose of this video we're just going to have this pretty set up in front of me which is not for binding spells of any particular note, any, any particular design. However, all of the crystals in shot could be used in different ways with regards to binding spells. And I'm going to leave you to figure that out and we might, we might hint at why at the end. So, in modern witchcraft, there tends to be a association with the idea of binding magic being purely to bind another against their will to stop them. Usually it being in modern sort of interpretation the binding of imaginary a magical practitioner. And this interpretation, this modern association, tends to come a little bit from movies. To say that there aren't spells out there in which you bind another person against their will, or attempt to bind another person against their will, would be wrong. There are spells that do that. And there are spells which even follow the methods as presented in certain movies whereby ribbon or thread is tied around a photograph being the most obvious version that I can think of that comes from movies. And in that particular movie it was to stop them doing harm. And there was kind of a justification for that kind of binding magic within that particular spell as presented by a film. Which was based and had a lot of research done in modern methods rather than facts, I suppose. Rather, yeah, modern methods of witchcraft. And in recent years, there has been confusion as to the difference between binding and banishing, which we will cover quickly because in simple terms it shouldn't be something that causes confusion when you really think about it in the most basic terms. I think a lot of the confusion comes from the fact that many, not all, but many spell books put them in the same section. Like banishing and binding spells are within their own section together and that can be a little bit confusing for the beginner. But in very very simple terms, banishing is to push, binding is to pull. So banishing is to use your magic to get rid of something, literally to banish it, to make it go away. To bind something is to attach, to tie something to you. Although, as we're going to find out, there is a slight misnomer in that all binding spells are to attach something to yourself, which is not strictly correct. We're going to discuss that again a bit, a bit more at length. So, 
To banish is to send away, to get rid of, to want it out of your space, want it out of your life, want it out of your energy, want it gone. And to bind is to bring something closer. And with that in mind, it's kind of odd really how the modern focus has been on this kind of spell work which binds somebody to them to stop them doing harm. Because in that particular spell that is from movies, from the craft, that would attach somebody's energies to you very much so. Because in terms of spell work there's no disassociation. It's very much about putting all of your energy into a spell that prohibits somebody performing magic. It is a bit of an odd one and has caused some concern over the years, although to be honest anyone with much sense knows that The Craft is an absolutely fabulous movie rooted in some truth but once you start doing your own research and your own reading then you quickly learn what is echoing truth and what is just plain sensationalist movie based witchcraft. So the first point I really wanted to make is there are as many binding spells and thoughts on binding spells and versions of binding spells and intentions of binding spells as there are witches. I grabbed three very different books to show you different types of binding spells as examples from different types of witches. And the different focus of each book is quite different. Uh, two of them are technically spell books so they're a little bit more similar but they have a different tone and we'll look at that in a minute. So the first thing that I wanted to pose as a question is which kind of spell do you think is most associated and most regularly with binding? And I will be quiet for a minute and let you think about it. And you can hold your answer and see if you uh, arrive at the same conclusion as me. <laughs> right, so the type of spell work in which there is the most amount of binding is love magic. So, Yes. <laughs> so the idea of binding in love spells works in a number of ways. There is the type of love spell which two people consensually do to bind themselves together, such as a hand fasting. Technically speaking, the two hands are bound. Oh, look, you can see my hand reflecting in the <laughs> tourmaline. Oh dear. Uh, are bound together with ribbon. This is a consensual aff affirmation of love. It's a pagan wedding pra practice which binds the energies and lives of two people together. It can, however, be undone with a consensual unbinding ritual for the same idea, a divorce, if you like. There are love spells in which the people bind themselves together for more than one lifetime. This is usually consensual, however this is not something that I would particularly encourage for a number of reasons. One, you might well be going against the natural flow of your life plan over many reincarnations. It may be that you are meant to be with a variety of different loves in many different lives. 
as part of the expansion process in enlightenment and part and parcel of becoming who you're meant to be throughout many lifetimes, sort of the growth of your soul and to bind or attempt to bind yourself to one person throughout many many lifetimes may well hinder your spiritual growth. It may well just not work because the universe has a much bigger plan for you and it may be that that love binding works in a limited capacity such as yes you will find that same person many many lifetimes over but it's not who you end up with or something of that merit plus if you fall out with the person that you have bound yourself to through many many lifetimes then what? It, there's, there's a souring of that energy of that feeling which basically permanently feeds such a love binding spell love binding spells that are consensual are basically fed by the energies between the two people who have bound themselves together so if you have negative feedings that's not really the greatest of circumstances to have been bound to someone there are the slightly less ethical love spells of binding you could perform a binding love spell to bind you to your true love destiny and that would be a little bit more ethical but there are people who bind themselves to people who they want to be their lover there are spells for that again it's a matter of ethics within particular magic It's very much up to the practitioner and how they feel about certain ethics of magic and it's a huge subject. However, I would always pose certain questions. What if the only reason they ended up with you is because you bound them to your will? And you know in that circumstance that A, they're magically A and uh, a little bit weak-minded, perhaps. Plus you kind of pushed them into it and that's kind of... That's not, kind of, that's not great. There's also a line of thought that feels that if you do such a thing it actually sours the love anyway because it wasn't meant to be or it wasn't meant to last so long and everything's kind of sours in it there's another line of thought that's like well if it was the person that you're meant to be with it really doesn't matter it may just have helped it along but again it's not wonderful there are spells of course to break binding spells there are many there are breakup powders there are post breakup cleansings all sorts of good stuff for that there are also other kinds of binding spells within uh, love magic and they're usually in reference to fidelity and binding someone to make sure that they will be loyal again that sort of magic underpins a problem with something being very wrong within love magic within within the relationship that to have to bind someone to be loyal and to achieve fidelity to me suggests there is a disconnect within the relationship, within the energy between the two people. It's a little bit like practical magic, you know, perhaps you'd find one better suited, but the spells exist. Again, that's referencing movies, but there is that. So, 
The Element Encyclopedia of 5,000 Spells references the most amount of love magic. She talks at length about the ethics of love magic and binding spells. Just having a look for which is a good one. She gives all the antidotes as well, which is always good to know. I think if if you want to be knowledgeable about these things, it's necessary to know about the antidotes. So you know that if perhaps someone has cast a love binding on you and you're thinking about them and thinking about them and thinking about them and you don't want to be, then there's something you can do about it. This is a nice simple one that I can just read. Pomegranate binding. To effect a binding, break open pomegranates. Two should be sufficient. One partner eats 220 seeds, the other eats 284. Count them and eat them together. There you go. So that's the sort of consensual thing that is done between two. It draws on symbolism of pomegranates, Hades and Personophy, and it's timely as we heading towards the autumn equinox. Not quickly enough. So these are some ideas, some examples of different types of love binding. Now I'm going to actually discuss something that I went through, sort of, with regards to a love binding that was a bit nasty. My sister was involved with somebody who was of a magical inclination, who was not a good person. He gifted her this love box and it was, you know, disguised as keeping the love happy sort of thing. And what it actually was was binding her heart to him and it was within it was a representation of the heart and it was full of crap and like black thread all tangled up in the heart and it was horrendous and one of the very when I well, no it wasn't one of the very first things I did I I cleansed the whole thing I had the whole thing submerged in water I had the whole thing submerged in healing herbs and gently you know, undoing every aspect, every element. It took me a week to undo it all. It's not pleasant when someone is trying to force you to behave in such a way against the will of your true heart. There are ways in which love spells can be done, even with an element of binding, without it being forceful and domineering. I think that's the key issue. Are you basically trying to dominate another against their will? Because domination is not love. It's worth thinking about. So another form of binding which isn't really talked about is the idea of a binding spell in a similar vein to the movie idea, to bind somebody's by their actions, but not to bind them to you, instead to bind them to consequence. And this is often the case as seen within justice magic. Now justice magic is another area in which I very rarely heard anybody really talk about the idea of a binding spell within justice magic. So basically if there's a court case going on and whoever it is is looking to get away with it and we're talking about you know binding spells are pretty much big gun spells they're not something you should be doing willy-nilly here there and everywhere because they obviously 
interfere with free will, which depending on what kind of uh, practitioner you are, hinges on your moral compass. Say, however, there is a murderer or a rapist getting away with what they've done and they're a serial murderer or rapist. And if they get away with it, they're only going to go and harm other people and they might even harm the victims. And you as a witch, what can you do? You can bind them to the truth. You can bind them to the justice system. You can bind them to the consequences of their actions. Make it so that everybody sees who they really are and the actions they've performed. Now, a really cute little book that I had really early on and actually is a really good little book for beginners has this sort of spell, to, to bind a wrongdoer by their own actions. Now in this particular spell it's requested that you have their hair and the idea of the binding spell is actually often tied to, historically speaking, that of a poppet. So the history of the European poppet is well known and it is the magic of usually wax but sometimes doll figures which has grown over the years and become different ideas and concepts but within rooted within history it tends to be the wax puppet and to be honest that's the one I favour particularly which in in which sometimes you will put materials of the person that the wax figurine is meant to represent. And again, this is another form of magic closely associated but not always used with binding, which is often used particularly in the media as a form of aggressive, malicious, negative magic, when in fact the magic itself is benign and it's what the individual witch does with it which determines whether or not what kind of magic you're performing. For example, you can use wax poppets for healing magic. You can do it for protection magic. You can do it for love magic. Again, love magic hinges on what you're actually doing, whether you're doing love magic or domination, and how you feel about it. I'm not here to provide any sort of moral or ethical judgement on any of the spells that are being discussed. It's just that I'm pointing out where these ethical question marks exist and it really is up to the practitioner to decide where their line is. So here we go. This is the spell I'm talking about. To bind a wrongdoer to their own actions and it talks about how to and you can just pause that if you want to read it a little bit more. Now if you don't have their hair You may wish to try a slightly different one, which is to diminish the power of a deceitful person. They suggest using the signature of the deceiver, or you could just write their name on it. So this sort of magic to diminish the power of a deceitful person, to bind a wrongdoer by their own actions, is again a binding spell which focuses on attaching one thing to another but rather than it being the oft cited you to something else you are sort of acting as the middleman in attaching the actions of the wrongdoer, the, the behaviour that person to the truth, to consequences to make sure that these things are tied together, tightly strangled together, that they cannot be disassociated, which in terms of justice magic is often necessary. The legal system allows so many people to get away with it. And if you feel it is your duty to do something about a certain case, then you perhaps you should.
particularly if it's involving loved ones and you just want justice and the truth so the final book that I picked was The Witch's Shield by Christopher Penzak and he actually references the kind of binding spell that you saw in the movies. Cord magic in which to bind all harm from the person being bound directing away from the heart from the person in their home. He talks a bit about poppets as well. I think we've actually talked a l as much about uh, poppets as we need to. The binding cord spell is very much like what you would find in the movie. Taking three pieces of yarn in colours that are protective to you, tie the yarn at the top, name them after your antagonist, braid them together and when you get one third of the way down tie a knot with the intention of knotting or blocking all harm done to you. Then do one at two thirds, then one at the end and bind the person from doing home to you doing home doing harm to you or your home and then bury the cord somewhere away from your home so it follows the idea of binding a person from doing harm against you so it kind of binds their energies and anything they do into the cord which you then bury so it's basically binding their energy from not being able to get to you. However, there is a slight issue. With all binding spells that you perform, your energy is what is being used to create. So even if you don't bind yourself in particular, and you're very careful about how you are doing a binding spell and what you're binding together, your energy is still present within the spell there is an energy signature and arguably the stronger practitioner would be able to link that and find a way back to you depending as well of course how well you buried it where you buried it the sort of pr magical work you have in place to protect yourself to banish all that which would come at you whether you have good protection work within your home to prevent any backlash, any magic coming and finding you from anything that you've done. These are all things to consider when looking at binding spells and basically binding spells are usually best used amongst a regimen of protective magic and the book I'm actually talking about with Penzac is this one, The Witch's Shield Protection Magic and Psychic Self-Defense, which is really great for many, many different ideas of spell work to do with protection magic. The final kind of binding spell, which is for the more advanced and is not something that I would personally six crows just flew past. It's not something that I will personally give a in-depth detailed idea about but I am going to mention it is the binding of spirits particularly within fetishes and uh, spirit jars. This can be done with spirits, spirit guides, sort of providing a home for spirit guides and it's not necessarily a permanent thing. It's not to give, it's not to attach their spirit on a permanent basis. It's more like allowing them that binding to that place to come and go as they please. So it's not sort of forcing them against their will into the, the fetish or into the spirit jar, uh, but it allows them freedom. <laughs> 
but also a place of power from when you're working within spirit work. However, that is a, I would probably say, advanced position. And because it's an advanced position, it's not something that I would make a video about, so don't ask me to, I'm not going to. And the reason for that is because I think it is on the individual to work out when they are ready for that and to read up on that and to find the information and do the legwork and know about the protection side of it and the respect side of it before they attempt such a thing. And I'm not going to provide, you know, easy steps on one, two, three, how to do that, which could get people into all sorts of trouble if they're just not ready and they haven't done the legwork. It's, it's not my responsibility to do the work for anybody. So I did just want to discuss that to mention that it is a form of binding spell, which is perhaps more advanced magic that is not often discussed because it just tends to be oh, you're trying to uh, prohibit somebody from doing magic, it tends to be brought to the fore. I think there are key things to really be thought of with regards to binding spells. When are you moving from binding, in some description, to domination is probably the key point with all binding spells. So, with regards to the justice, when you really want the truth to come out, you want to bind someone to the truth and have the truth about that person be shown, that is erring in the area of binding that is justifiable as far as I'm concerned. To some people bindings aren't justifiable at all and that's up to them. However, when you're moving into the idea of I can't prove that this person did it. I don't actually know if they did it. It's just that I believe that they did it. So, you know, you... and perhaps you have nothing to do with the case. Or you're just angry, basically, and you want someone to suffer, and you're not looking at it with a reasonable mind you're not looking at it with a fairness and you don't want them to be held accountable, you just want somebody to suffer, then you're moving into domination for the sake of domination and anger. When working with the Morrigan in particular there is the notion of justifiable wrath, which is different from the idea of wrath that you can justify, because the human mindset is usually to excuse most kinds of spell work, most kinds of line of thought, most kinds of behaviour. It really is about the individual practitioner to work out what is unacceptable, what behaviour that has been directed at them is damaging and hurtful and harmful if they are being abused by another person in some form and how best to react to that. That is the justifiable wrath and in most cases I personally offer it up to the Morrigan because she's going to deal with it far more seriously than I am and she knows what needs dealing with and what is justifiable. And it's in her eyes, not mine, so my human fallibility gets removed from the equation. That's just personally. There are also ideas of binding spells that you can really look to that can be a completely positive binding. To bind yourself to the best outcome. To bind yourself to your own determination to succeed in a particular circumstance. You can use binding within success spells to bind that success to you and your determination so that you sort of fuel your own determination to succeed. It's all about how you look and interpret and really investigate particular spells which seems to matter more rather than just 
sort of dismissing out of hand particular types of spell because one movie said so and then everybody jumps on that bandwagon. So that's going to be it for this particular video. Many blessings.